Hello again, and welcome back to day three of Listen Up, the power of podcasting. Um, for the second part of this evening, we we have Maeve McCannigan again with us. Um, I'm very excited uh, to have her with us. For those of you who also joined us for the first part of the conversation, she did an excellent job interviewing Paul Garana, Garana Galizia about his podcast, My Mother's Murder. And this is something that you usually probably see her doing in her own podcast called The Tip-Off, which brings us behind the scenes of big investigative stories. She is an investigative reporter herself with the Bureau of Investigative Journalism in, in the UK. And um, uh, some of her work appeared in The Guardian. She did stories for BBC Radio, etc. And she's not just writing story dolls, she's looking for new ways to tell stories and have a very innovative approach to uh, bringing stories about domestic violence to live audiences around the UK. Um, and she's trying to do that uh, as well with, again, her podcast, The Tip Off. Uh, but without further ado, uh, I want to give the floor, or the Zoom in this case, uh, to Maeve. And um, I'm looking forward to hearing more and more, learning more of how you do your podcast. So take it away. Thank you so much. And hi, everyone. Um, and welcome back to those who are in the previous session. Of course, the great thing about podcasting is you can go back and edit out all of the technical blips. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite the same with live uh, presentations, but hopefully um, we'll get through this one okay. I'm going to talk a little bit about my own podcast and then talk you through some of the storytelling techniques and the elements of, of how to put investigative journalism into a podcast format. Um, kind of tips of the trade, I guess, that I have learnt and, uh, and developed over the years. And we'll talk as well about some things to look out for when you're thinking about making these kind of podcasts. And we'll finish off with some recommendations. And indeed, if people have recommendations that they want to give, maybe you could uh, put them in the chat at the end. But um, I guess I am an example of a podcaster from the real the kind of grassroots level so um, as was mentioned I'm, I'm an investigative journalist and my day job is I work at the Bureau of Investigative Journalism here in the UK but my podcast The Tip Off is completely independent and it really was a labour of love and came about because I think I had the idea sat in a pub talking to friends one evening and once I had the idea I kind of just had to run with it and the concept was you know the product the end result of investigative journalism is always fascinating and um, what people present what people find out is really truly very interesting but what else is really interesting is all of the work that goes into it behind the scenes and um, you know I would I have a lot of friends who work as investigative journalists and we would sit around and they would tell me about the time they were undercover and their wig slipped off and they had to, you know, panic and, and think of a way to cover it up or the time they were trying to um, doorstep someone and they spotted that there was a garden gnome in the garden and that was the clue that they needed to tell them this was the right person. You know, all of these behind the scenes um colourful elements that wouldn't ever make it into a final story uh, but that I thought was really interesting. So once I had that idea I decided I was just going to start um, making this podcast. I make it on my own, I have very basic equipment, I started using just a free software called Audacity and taught myself to edit. Uh, you can certainly hear that in the first couple of episodes, it's me making it up as I go along. And later on, I brought in uh, some people to help me edit and, and make it sound a bit more professional. But that's all just to explain that you don't need a huge budget. You don't need uh, a huge organization backing you to do podcasts. The beauty of the format is that they really are, um, you know, an equalizer. They let anybody tell their story. And if you have an interesting enough story to tell, then, you know, hopefully people will catch on 
and listen. So I'm going to try and share my screen with you all so we can go through a presentation. And I am also going to try and play some audio clips. So fingers crossed this works. Let me go share computer sound. So hopefully now you can see my presentation. Um, let me just start this slideshow and we'll get going. So as mentioned, my name is Maeve McLennigan. You can find me on Twitter at MaeveMCC and my podcast is at Tip Off Podcast. So the Tip Off started a few years ago and it has been a fantastic success. It's won some really nice awards. It's got some really lovely reviews, but it really is a, a fairly simple concept, which is that I sit down and I interview an investigative journalist, uh, much like Paul Caruana Galizia, and we talk about everything that went into their investigation, all of the kind of little elements of how they ran down the story, the issues they might have faced, the frustrations they might have faced along the way. And then I write a, a narrative um, kind of arc around that and edit it quite heavily to give the sense that we're on the journey with them, that you're kind of stood by their side as they're doing their detective work. Um, so you can go back and listen to, I think I've got about 35, 36 episodes out. Um, and as well as being, I guess, an example of a podcast in itself, I also am really inspired every time I interview each of these investigative journalists to find out their tricks of the trade, how it was they found the story, how it was they navigated any of the complications that they might have found. And every single time I talk to somebody, I learn something new that I can then use in my own journalism and take with me. So um, it's kind of a, a learning material as much as it is a, a fun podcast as well. So um, do have a listen if you need some inspiration for how to find and develop your investigations. So if you yourselves are thinking of making a podcast that involves investigative journalism, obviously the first step is finding your investigation, which is easier said than done. Um, some of you might already be journalists, some might not, but an investigation generally starts with a hypothesis, which is a question that you want to test, um, that you want to dig into and find the answer for. So you don't start out knowing what you're going to find, which is why investigative journalism is long and tedious and expensive in some cases, because it doesn't always work. You might work for months on something, and never find an answer, or it, it turns out that there isn't a story. But sometimes you do, or you find something else out. So you start with your hypothesis, and I often come across mine by, uh, sometimes it's by reading the news, and almost reading in between the lines of stories, and thinking, what what isn't being said here? Or how did this come to be? Or, um, yeah, you know, what's going on behind the scenes that we got to this point. So that can help draw things out. Or it might be talking to sources and they bring you something. In some cases, you might get a fantastic leaked document or, um, you know, a huge data dump like the Panama Papers. But those are few and far between often. And um, more often than not, it's you kind of having a hunch about something and deciding to follow the trail. I would also say, um, if you're thinking of making an investigative podcast, it needs to be something that you're really passionate about because it's gonna take a lot of work and a lot of time. And if you lose interest in the subject halfway through, uh, it's gonna be a really tedious job. And that's probably going to translate into you know into how you tell the story so if you really are interested and fascinated in your topic even if 95 percent of what you find out doesn't make it into your final product there's that's going to reflect in the way that you tell your story it's also important to you know think about is this interesting to others you might be hugely passionate to do an investigation into 
whatever you know the wildlife in your garden um but are other people really going to care about that so you you know you might want to canvas some opinions and say um you know is this something that people are going to listen to is it worth your while putting all this information out there and you know there are a lot of podcasts around today um don't let you put don't let that put you off but maybe do do some solid research into what else is out there has somebody already covered this subject thoroughly is there anything more that you can add to it or are you going to spend all this time doing work that actually it turns out everybody already knows and has been listening to already and then finally when thinking about subject it's worth thinking about is a podcast the best medium for it there are some fantastic investigations really complicated ones you know i might argue that the panama papers is an example of you know they found a lot of really complicated interesting stuff shell companies all attached to each other but that but a podcast might not be the best way to explain that the best way to get that story across because you might need visuals you might need um to lay the data out in a graph or you might just need a written piece where you, the reader can go back and remind themselves who it is you're talking about you know if you have a lot of figures i think somebody once told me in a half hour radio piece you shouldn't have more than three figures in it like three bits of data in it because as a listener you just can't take it in if you're saying there was a 52% increase and this number and 5 million pounds and etc cetera, etc cetera, you're just going to lose people and the great thing about podcasting is you know it's a really intimate experience of listening people are you know carrying your voice around in their ears but at the same time they might be doing the dishes they might be picking the kids up from school they might be driving and um, so anything too um granular and complex might not work for a podcast you might find a way to do it but um that's just something to think about now i i couldn't possibly train you on how to do an investigation in an hour um or a week or probably a month um but some techniques you might use um are things like freedom of information requests if those exist in your country we're very fortunate in the uk in that lots of government public bodies um have to give over information if you ask for it in the right way uh they often find excuses not to but that can be a way to get your information you might use public data that is already out there um there's an amazing open source investigations that use databases that exist or google maps or any kind of public data uh to find stories and to dig into stories and um there's some examples in the tip off of people doing that and you might want to look at resources by places like um the global network of investigative journalists and the night center do some amazing um online courses where you can learn a little bit about some of those techniques another classic one of course is doing interviews and um uh yeah just talking to sources and uh that's quite you know the classic classic way of doing investigative journalism but finding those sources can be something in itself you might need to use social media find their facebook profile find their twitter handle you might need to use linkedin or something similar to find them online to make that initial approach you might use public reports or create your own timelines and um, you know sometimes for example um you know in the story that that Paul was talking about my mother's murder there's a lot of things that happen over a period of time and to keep track of that if you plot it in a timeline you might notice that your genphenic pops up here and here and here and here where you might not have noticed that if if you weren't looking at it in a kind of linear way and you might want to familiarize yourself with reading accounts and uh, company official reports to to find out what they're saying and what's hidden in the small print someone once told me when looking at company accounts um start at the end 
and read backwards because it's always the little bits that they put in the kind of side notes where they hope that nobody has bothered to continue reading where the real juicy uh, details are. So once you've got your idea for your investigation, there's certain things you're going to want to think about in terms of the format of telling that. Are you going to make a one-off documentary? You might think, you know, this is really solid. Um, I'll tell it in one story and that will be it. Or is it going to be a serialized drama? Um, I would warn, <laughs> I, I, I think if you're going to serialize it and there's fantastic examples of people doing really great serialized investigations, but you have to make sure that the story warrants it. So I've listened to some podcasts that have made it into a 10 part series and I've listened and thought this could have been done in two episodes, in three episodes. They're really dragging it out <laughs> now. Um, and that can be quite tedious and turn listeners off. So, you know, how many parts are you going to do? Um, My Mother's Murder is a really interesting example, just four parts. Um, and there's a huge amount, like Paul was saying, you could have done, gone on and done more, but that is enough to tell the crux of the story. Um, and it keeps you engaged and it makes sure that the, the, the important points come across. So, and how long are your episodes going to be? Um, interestingly, I never really set out with a time limit when I am making the tip off, um, but they seem to naturally happen to be about 30 minutes when I come to write my scripts and edit them down. And I think that's just because for my personal taste and my ear, that's about the, the length of time that I concentrate for. Um, the kind of, the, it gives me space to tell a story, but it's not so long that I am getting bored and laboring the point. Um, now there are other examples of fantastic hour long episodes. There's also some really interesting podcasts, I think that do little five minute snippets and 10 minute snips of, of things. Um, so you, you're gonna to want to consider what kind of length you're doing. And if you are doing a series of episodes, are they all going to be the same length? So the listener kind of comes to expect it, or are you going to have shorter episodes and then longer episodes? Um, lots of decisions to be made. Uh, is there going to be a kind of narrator scripted um, tone, or will it be two people in a room having a discussion? You know, there's lots of podcasts like that. Um, some people like that idea of listening in to two friends having a chat. You might want to do that or you might want to do something a bit more um, structured and uh, almost kind of a dramatic element to it. And do you have a satisfying conclusion to your investigation? I'm not saying you need that to do a good investigative podcast, but there are some examples out there that start off and then never come to a kind of conclusive ending. And that can be quite frustrating. And it can sometimes be ethically and legally tricky as well. You know, if you're setting off on a strand of investigation and you don't know where you're going and you don't know that the wrong ones that you're talking about are wrong ones, um, you know, that's not necessarily ethical to, to put that out there and to raise a load of questions and kick up dust about people. Doesn't quite fall into that category, but for example, the very first series of Serial, which I think was most people's introduction to podcasts, me included, and certainly to investigative podcasts, raised a lot of questions, but didn't have a definitive conclusion. And you might feel that that left you wanting as a listener, or you might think, do you know what? It doesn't matter. They asked questions. That was the important thing. So that's something to consider. Um, I'm not going to talk about the kit that I use or the technicalities because uh, I'm not an expert in that. But there is a Facebook page called Podcasters Support Group, um, which is set up by Helen Zaltzman, who does The Illusionist um, and other podcasts. And it's a place where lots of people go and have asked questions about what's the best kit to use. And so they have some documents, kind of pinned documents that talk you through 
here's how you record over Zoom or Skype, uh, here's the best reporter's mic, et cetera, et cetera. So that's some, I'll, I'll send you guys there to look at that. Um, okay, so you've got your idea for your investigation. You've got a sense of the structure, the format you're going to use. Now you might want to think about the tone of the piece. Um, are you going to really dive in and tell a beautifully rich, detailed story like S-Town or Shittown did and was renowned for doing? Might you use different interviews with, with people to really make it feel human and personal? Um, and, and that requires getting incredible access to your protagonists. So Dirty John, I think, is an example of that it was uh, started as an LA Times long read magazine piece, uh, sorry, newspaper piece, but um, then developed into a podcast because they had access to these women who had been um, uh, tricked by this man, Dirty John. And so, you know, that, that the podcast gives a really human element of that. Um, are, is there going to be a personal journey like My Mother's Murder? Or is it going to be more detached and factual, factual like The Daily, which is the New York Times' um, you know, uh, daily podcast? Or, you know, investigations don't have to be into huge corruption or murders or, or terrible wrongdoings. They can also be a, an investigative element of, of something lighter. You know, you might, your favourite ice cream might have been discontinued and you decide you're gonna set out and find out whatever happened to your ice cream or similar. And I'm gonna try and play you a clip from, oops, from um, the mystery show, which was a podcast made by Starly Klein, um, an American journalist and podcaster. And she basically set off on a series of strange little investigations things like what is the actor Jake Gyllenhaal's real height? You know, not hard hitting Pulitzer Prize winning investigations, but the way that she framed it and the way that she wrote her script was in a kind of um, film noir, gumshoe journalist detective story that um, gave it quite a nice uh, whimsical feel. So let me play you a little bit of this. And hopefully it will play for you. Uh, so she's talking about um, somebody has found a belt buckle on the street and have asked her to find out who it belonged to. I would find Hans Jordy and return his buckle to him, even though this case made my stomach hurt a little. The buckle was that rarest of things an object as enchanting in actuality as it was as a story. What were the chances that the real life Hans Jordy and the real life Bob Six would be that too? I wasn't in the preserving whimsy and wonder business though. I was in the mystery solving business and I had my work cut out for me. There were so many gaps to fill in. For example, I already knew Hans's position on miniature toasters but nothing at all about how he felt about regular-sized ones. So, there we go. Setting up that she's going out on this investigation. Um, but, you know, it's not serious. It's whimsical. It's light in tone. But she's written the script in such a way that it still draws you in and you care about something as potentially anodyne as finding out who owns this belt buckle. You're going to also want to think about structure of your podcast. Um, that relates to each episode as much as to the whole series structure. So I try and think of each episode and the series in three acts. So you start out with a question, with a hypothesis, with a problem. You then go on a journey in the second act. And then the third act is the resolution. And thinking like that in quite a kind of um, dramatic narrative way can keep you from wandering off into too many di directions, can keep your listener really engaged because there's a kind of trust that the, you, you know where the story's going somewhere. 
you're not just listening to the random uh, ramblings of somebody that, that actually has a point. You might decide that one way to do that is to find a protagonist whose journey you can follow. Um, I'm going to play you another clip now, which is from an American show called Embedded. This was an episode about the opioid crisis in the USA. Um, and it's talking about something fairly nebulous, a very big kind of societal issue. And you could just talk about it that way. But what the host does or the, the, um, the podcast team do is find individuals that can, through which they can tell that story. So they come across a couple whose child has been taken into care, um, both of whom are suffering with addiction issues. And through those protagonists, we learn a little bit more about the opioid crisis and um, its impact in a way that just talking about it wouldn't get across. So we'll have a quick listen to this. I mean, I really don't want to talk about my kids. It's just too hard for me. He doesn't want to talk about the kids, but he will say that in order to get them back, he has to be clean. The mother of the kids, Samantha, she's already clean because she's in jail. She was arrested on prostitution charges and pleaded guilty. And she's getting out, right? Devin says she gets out in a few days. I've got to change my ways right now in the next week before she gets out because she's been so unclean for five or six months now and she's not wanting to come back here to this place so she gets it that she's like I can't she knows that if she comes here that it'll be it'll be an influence so you're going to try to get clean before she comes out so there you go rather than talking about this in a uh, kind of um, big picture way you go on a journey with those people uh, another classic documentary method is that you show you don't tell so rather than you know they're embedded rather than them saying uh opioid addiction affects lots of families and occasionally it can have impacts on children etc you know they don't have to spell it out to you because you learn it through these characters and through what's happening to them uh in the same way you might and this is the beauty of audio and podcasting you can use atmospheric tape so recordings of your environment to help position the listener where you are. So, um, you know, you're at a protest, you're at a riot and you can hear people shouting and screaming. So you, as the presenter, don't have to say people were shouting and screaming, fireworks were going off. You know, you can let the listener fill in the blanks and, and um, tell the story themselves which uh, is a really good tip, I think, is to not uh, patronise your listeners, give them a chance to fill in the gaps and to feel like they're part of the storytelling technique. You might drop straight into the action or you might give a, a kind of introduction. Um, I'll come back to twists because that's another section I'm going to play. Um, you might decide in your structure that, you know, if you're doing lots of uh, episodes you'll have set segments so for example reply all is another you sorry lots of my examples are us based which shows i listen to too many american podcasts um but reply all for example have a section called yes yes no it's a technology podcast where they talk about um you know do you understand this meme or this tweet and that can happen in lots of episodes heavyweight is another show which starts with a phone call to his best friend in each episode and it gives a kind of structure to your series, but it also takes some of the legwork off you when you're writing it because you know, okay, halfway through, we do this bit every time. Um, and, you know, in structure, you can use twists in a narrative. So you might not start at the beginning of the story and work linearly through to the end. You might drop in at a certain place, loop back, go back to the beginning, and then carry on through. And I've done that in some examples of the tip off, you know, it helps to get the listener hooked in immediately. And Criminal, which is one of my, my favorite shows, um, does this brilliantly. You can be listening for a good five minutes before you know what, the, which, what each episode is about. 
And I'm going to play you this, which is the start of one of my favorites, which I think is a really good example of this. I've never been a criminal of sorts, you know, I've just, um, I've found a way to challenge law, if you like. This is Mark Roberts. You may never have heard of him, but his name and his face are well known to law enforcement all over England. Before every major event, they have a big speech about what to look out for and I come up every single time a big picture of me on screen everyone's given a picture of me to look out for me you know I I'm looking at your Wikipedia page right now I don't know I, I don't know who wrote that it certainly wasn't me and a lot of it's not true but there is this naked picture of you yeah oh that's definitely me then Mark I'll stop that there but as you can see it goes on um so that, that, that introduction carries on for quite a bit and you as a listener are listening and thinking, what on earth is happening? Are they talking to, you know, is this guy a terrorist? Is he a prolific pickpocket? What, you know, how is he a criminal? And it's only at the end of that whole introduction, about five minutes in, that it's revealed that he is almost a professional streaker. So he goes to different sporting events, takes off all his clothes and runs onto the pitch. And as he was saying, he's so well known in that industry that the security guards across the world are poised to look out for him. Now, you could have started that episode by saying, today we're going to talk to a prolific streaker, you know, and that's interesting. But I think by doing it like that, by setting it up, it really hooks you as a listener. And, you know, it made me kind of stop in the street as I was listening and go, ha, ah, that's ridiculous and made me remember it. So are there ways that you can twist what you think the, the uh, listener is assuming um, and kind of use those assumptions to your advantage? Okay, so structure done. When you're coming to record, you know, you're gonna have to think about booking your guests, working out which voices you need to tell a story you might not end up using all of those interviews and you should be quite selective about what really worked, who really spoke to the issues you were talking to. Um, you might think about where you're going to record. Sometimes, you know, if it's a complicated, serious uh, interview, being somewhere like a studio or somewhere quiet where you can do the recording is important because the listener is going to need to concentrate on what you're saying. And if they can hear cars going by, or in my case, my baby crying downstairs, that, that might put you off. Um, or is it better to be out in the field and somewhere atmosphere atmospheric that actually adds to the interview and the recording? I won't play it, but I was going to play an example of a guy, uh, Adam Buxton, going around an art gallery and talking to his interviewee about what they're seeing. Um, and it doesn't matter that you can hear their footsteps and it doesn't matter that you can hear people bustling in the background because that's the whole point is you're there with them. Uh, but if that went on for 30 minutes and they were talking about something serious, the ear might start to get tired and you might turn off. So think about that. You know, doing a good investigative interview is a skill in itself and it's something you're going to learn as you go along. But you're going to want to think carefully about how you plan your questions. You know, do you go in aggressively at the start if you're challenging somebody? Are you trying to tease out information that you don't have? Or are you trying to pin them down and get them to, um, to kind of say something that, that will put them in the frame for it. So, you know, plan your questions accordingly. You might want to start softly, softly, and then get more serious, um, or you might want to get straight to the point. Some people might say they want to, you know, see the questions beforehand, and that's a decision you have to make. Are you given, gonna give them prior warning, prior knowledge? I don't, and the reason I don't is, not always because I'm trying to trip someone up, um, that's that's not always the case but you don't want people or I don't want people to sound rehearsed when they're giving their answers and sometimes you know if you've given them 
what you're going to ask, you might get the kind of press office response, PR response, where they're almost reading from a piece of paper and you can hear it in their voice. So sometimes I'm thinking as they're talking um, is, is a nicer way to, to listen to it. Um, think about the ways, like we said, you're going to find the colour, you're going to paint the picture of this. So here in the UK, I think we're not great sometimes at storytelling. People go straight to the point. My American friends tell a lot, tell a much better story, in my opinion. And that's because often they talk in, and this is a huge generalisation, but often they talk in uh, first person continuous uh, tense. So they might say, so I'm walking down the street and I'm thinking to myself, oh my gosh, I need to get home. And then I hear the sound and I'm like, what's going on? Whereas a Brit might say, I was walking in the street and I heard a sound. And it's a little bit more uh, <laughs> kind of cold and, and whatever. So when I'm asking questions of my um, interviewees, I'm trying as much to go back and go over as many times as I need to, to say, okay, but tell me, tell me again, but tell me what's going through your head. As you're stood on that doorstep about to knock and confront this person, what are you thinking? What's the weather like? What had you done just, you know, how had you arrived at that interview? What, what, were, what was going through your mind? Were you having a good day? Were you thinking about what you were going to have for tea? You know, help us to get into that moment and paint that picture for us. And that can mean you go over and over the same question again and again, and people might get a bit confused and think, I, I think I told you this, but you're, as a, with your producer ear, trying to listen so that they're telling you, you know, enough detail that as a listener, you feel like you're there in the moment with them. Um, and that can be really important for investigations because there can be a lot of dry detail and you kind of really want to get people in and feeling the, the drama of what's happening and get them really engaged with the minutiae of every single moment. And like I said before, you know, you can use atmospheric tape to do that as well. Um, sometimes you might go back and, you know, you, you might not have been able to record enough at that moment. Uh, you might go back and record some noise of the, the traffic sound or the, tube, uh, the train station, whatever it might be afterwards. Or, you know, I've worked on podcasts before where my producers have told me the moment you step out of your hotel room, set your microphone running and keep it running. Um, and so, you know, you hear me getting into the taxi and shutting the door. You hear me fumbling for my change. You, you, you know, we might end up not using any of that, but it might just be that you need to use a few little clips like that to that you decide to tell the story of on the way in the taxi. I was worried and, you know you have the atmospheric tape to do that. Here's me ringing the doorbell. I then have to make sure that I let people know that I'm recording. So I ring the doorbell and as soon as they answer, I say, hello, hi, Maeve, I'm here to talk to you about this. I have got my microphone running. I'll stop that if you want, or it's okay, we'll just keep going um, to be free and open. Unless you decide you're doing undercover and you feel like you have enough legal um prima facie evidence and legal uh, understanding and backing to do that safely. Uh, otherwise it's better to be upfront and to tell people you're recording when you're recording. Um, and then, you know, if you're going to do interviews, are you going to have several people in the room while you do the interview or is it going to be one-to-one? -one? Some things to think about. Um, we've talked a little bit about uh, the journey, the kind of story arc, but that's something that might come out in the scripting. So you've gone out, you've collected all this tape. You might have, tran well, I, I try to transcribe it all. I try to make notes, especially if I'm going out and hitting record when I leave my hotel room um, and leave my recorder running for hours. I try to take notes that, oh, about two hours in, um, that's when I rang the doorbell. Or about halfway through the interview, they said something really interesting. I'm going to make a note now so that later when I have hours or days of tape, I can remember the one thing I know that this person told me and I have it here in my notebook is around halfway through the interview. So I'll go back and find it that way. Um, so you have all of this wealth of, of detail and then you want to be quite... Um, brutal, I guess, when it comes to editing it down and thinking, 
how, what are the three acts that I'm going to tell? What is the journey we're going on? How am I going to get this narrative arc out? And sometimes, you know, there will be natural moments of tension. And if you listen to the tip off, you'll hear those people describing them. And sometimes you might need to ramp them up a bit, you know, and <laughs> you might hear that. For example, in the tip off, I sometimes talk to journalists who have done freedom of information requests. Um, and that can be sending off an email and waiting for it to come back. Now, I can make that sound a bit more dramatic in the scripting and the editing by writing something like, they sent off the email. Would it be answered? When would they get their information? They waited and waited. And then finally, here, you know, you can write your script to kind of ramp up the drama a little bit in that way. You might use music to do that as well. Um, I tend to look for a kind of rhythm in the edit. And sometimes that can be visual. So you'll have your own way of editing the story, but I have different lines in Audacity or whatever program you're running. Here's my narr narration, here's interviewer one, here's interviewer two, etc. And I can even see visually that I talk for way too long here and then it cuts to them for a tiny bit and then way too long, or it's gone too staccato so it's gone I talk they talk I talk they talk I talk and the rhythm of that might feel off to you um I think that the best thing I can say on that is immerse yourself in podcasts listen to as many as you can and your ear will start to pick up what the rhythm feels like where you think things you might start noticing it now like oh it's really starting to drag here or I feel like I've heard this person's voice for a really long time and I'm starting to switch off. Um, and then apply that to your own uh, episodes. And it's something I do is try and listen to it over and over again and try and hear those moments where I've been talking way too long or this person has been talking way too long and I need to interject and or paraphrase what they're saying. You might, I think you had somebody from Radio Lab in but something that they do um, ooh, amazingly is uh what i've heard somebody call trample the tape um i'll play an example of this because it's easier to hear than it is to explain but it's that really radio lab um uh style that they have of really kind of quick interjections um between the hosts and the interviewees so we'll listen to a little clip. It doesn't really matter what they're talking about. It's a kind of science experiment, I think, about listening of how plants uh, grow. But just listen to how they have spliced the interviewer, Robert Crowich, the, the um, I think I'm saying his name right, the, the, the host with the interviewee. And um, yeah, take a listen. There we go. Monica thought about that and designed a different experiment. Again, if you imagine the, the pot, my experimental pot. With the forked bottom. Yeah, but then have two very different options for our plant. On one side, instead of the pipe with water, she attaches an MP3 player with a little speaker playing a recording of the sound of water. And then on the other side, Monica has another MP3 player with a speaker, but this one plays nothing. So she's got her plants in the pot. And so there we go. Don't need to go much further with that. But you get the you get the idea. Um, you know, they didn't go to Monica and say, can you just say nothing? Can you just say the plant pot? You know, she did that interview. She, she spoke at length, I'm sure. And then they went back and they wrote their script around it. And Robert's voice interjects here and interjects there. And it's a way of... Um, livening up the interview I guess for me as a listener it really keeps my ear engaged sometimes it can be done too much my partner isn't a fan of it he's sometimes like it's giving me a headache to hear so many different voices just tell me the story but it can be a way that you think you know let's let's get this a bit more engaging and sometimes if you've done a really important interview but somebody has maybe delivered it in a slightly monotone way or they haven't kind of imbued the right sense of urgency to it you could use that kind of technique to make sure their voice is still included um 
but you're helping to write around what they're saying to, to liven it up a bit. Uh, you might decide to use music or special effects. Uh, I talked a bit earlier about using, you know, stories with a lot of data, uh, a lot of facts and figures in, or figures particularly, can be hard to tell. You might think about sonification of data. Um, Reveal, which is another US podcast, did an example of this, which I will play you because I just think it's really interesting. It takes a lot of... Um, probably a lot of time and resources, but it's a way of kind of using musicality to present big data, uh, sorry, not big data, to present data um, in a way, rather than explaining it, you kind of let it tell its own story. So, I hope I have this one, yeah. This is Reveal talking about um, earthquakes in, I think it's in California. Um, and they make this bit of music, which is every time in a kind of timeline, every time there is an earthquake, you hear a tone and depending, and they explain this in it, and depending on how high or how low that tone is, depends on how big the earthquake was. And well, just listen and see what, what you deduce from this bit of music about the frequency and the seriousness of earthquakes over time. took a lot of work to do but um, well, what they um but it you know they were making the point about um the frequency of earthquake earthquakes becoming you know more and more frequent in california then becoming more serious over that time and by doing it that way it kind of resonates with you as a listener in a way that you just saying that might not do so I went away from that thinking, oh, crumb, something is happening with the, you know, fault lines or uh, whatever it might be, fracking or whatever it might be that is causing um, this increase in tremors. And that's quite worrying. And that stuck with me in a way that me just telling you that wouldn't have. Um, another really practical point in when scripting is if you are going to try and get sponsorship or ads, you might want to write in the ad breaks something I didn't do at the start of my series of the tip off because I didn't expect it to be as popular as it was and to get sponsors and ads. But it means that uh, then I was just dropping ad breaks into random moments. Um, whereas now I try and either say something like more after this or just leave a little pause here or there where I know this is a, a sensible place where coming out of the story to have an ad, an advert wouldn't be too disruptive and then go back in. And you might want to think about, are you going to try and present it with a natural voice or is it going to be more poetic? So are you going to read from your script, which has every single word that you're going to say um, lined up? Or are you going to try and just have the bullet points and maybe just talk naturally? So someone like Ira Glass at um, This American Life has that real kind of natural voice I think they they script quite heavily and I think he knows what he's going to say but he's such a professional that it sounds like him just saying oh here we are in my room and I'm having a chat um but as somebody new to podcasting 
you might find that harder to do. So you might instead want to just think, these are the points I'm going to get across and I'll try and just chat about it. Or you might think, I really need to make sure that, you know, maybe this is legally sensitive and maybe it's really complicated and I need to write out precisely what it is I'm going to say or else I might get in trouble. And then obviously with investigations, you need to think about safety. So are your sources that you're including all protected? And um, that might be people who, you know, you quote or um, interview in the podcast or people behind the scenes. Could it be that they get into trouble by telling you what they've told you and how are you going to mitigate that? And are they aware of those issues? So, you know, if a source, a whistleblower, for example, uh, comes to me, I need to make sure that they followed the, the protocol in their organisation. That means that they're protected. So that might mean that they need to raise their concerns with their line managers first and, and try and pursue the normal complaints channels. And then if they come to me after that, they have more protection legally than if they just... Um, kind of come out with uh, come to me as the initial issue and um, if they're sharing documents have they shared them in a safe way uh, you know are we using uh, PGP or some kind of encryption software signal or um, proton mail or something to share the documents is there any way that it can be traced back to their own computers you know their work computers the um that their, their IP addresses, whatever it might be, the printers, you know, I think, I can't remember who it was, but there was some case where one organization published a visual off a printout that had been given and the organization was, been, was able to tell because of the, something about the printer who it must have been and that person then got in trouble. So you can't be too cautious when it comes to source protection um, and you have to be completely honest with your sources and they have to be aware that, you know, that there might be consequences to them, them, them talking to you. Uh, if you're going to anonymize them and you tell them you're going to anonymize them, how are you going to do that? So I did a, a podcast about um, women fleeing domestic violence and decided that, you know, even though these women, some of them wanted to tell their story, uh, you know, and they said, can we just change our names? And I thought, you know what, if it were me and it was my, you know, if I was listening to somebody I knew very well and even though they'd changed their names, I might still think, hang on, that's X person talking. And you might still be able to identify them, even if they don't think they're identifiable. And who knows, you might hear the train announcer in the background or some bit of information that gives away their uh, their location you know you've got to think about those things what what is this as anonymous as it could be is it safer maybe to get an actor to read their uh, testimony or their script or is it not so serious that you could just change their name and that would be safe enough you know you're, you're reporting I, I don't know how many of you are journalists but those of you that are out there you know that you need to be fair and balanced you don't want to just pick out the bits of information that agree with your hypothesis. You're trying to challenge it. You're almost trying to um, disprove it because if you find that you can't, then you know that you've really got something good. Um, in your reporting, are you making sure that you tell both sides of that story as much as, as is fair and is necessary? And have you gone to everybody that you are accusing and given them the chance to talk and tell their story. That's really important, not just because, you know, it protects you to an extent legally um, and, you know, and it makes sure that you're, you're balanced, but it's also really practical because they might tell you, actually, you completely misunderstood this bit of information and your story is wrong. And, you know, you, you want to test that and make sure they're not just spinning you uh, a line, but it, Right of replies are a chance for you to to correct yourself as well and make sure that you're not putting out something that could get you sued, that could get you sent to prison, that could get you in trouble. You know, investigative journalism is tricky and complicated and 
you need, <laughs> and this is why I made the tip off, because you need every point to be accurate. And we're getting one thing wrong, even if it's something quite simple, can undermine all of the bigger points of the story that you're trying to make. So part of my telling, you know, doing the tip off and having investigative journalists tell their stories is to try and get across just how hard people work to get the tiny bullet point in the 50th paragraph of each article um, absolutely accurate. So you need to do the same in your podcast because you get one thing wrong, people are going to switch off or worse, you're going to get into real trouble. And, you know, ideally, like I say, I make my podcast um, uh, independently. And that's because I'm talking to journalists who have already gone through the kind of editorial oversight um, elements of their investigations. They've had somebody fact check it thoroughly. They've had somebody, um, you know, decide what are the risks, the legal risks? What can we say? How far can we push it? What can't we say? Um, and that gives a sense of protection to me because I know that I'm not going beyond that. Um, but if I were doing my own investigative stuff, which you know I, I have done and I will do, uh, it is helpful or vital sometimes to have an editor, not just to tell you what's interesting and what's not and where you've gone down a rabbit hole that no one else cares about, but also to say, you know, this is too dangerous to say, or, you can say this and we will protect you. And if you get sued, we'll take on the legal costs and fight your battles rather than you doing it alone. So that's something else to think about. And then finally, I think before we go to questions, oh, we're running out of time. Uh, just some suggested listening. Again, lots of US ones. I would love to hear about some um, European examples. But my favorite, favorite investigative podcast is called In the Dark. Their, ser their second series is an incredible masterclass, I think, in one, doing an investigation, and two, telling it. You really go on a journey with them. You go, it's about um, looking into a man who was convicted of uh, multiple murders. And while there's lots of cold case investigations out there that don't really go anywhere, this one has incredible impact. And they basically exonerate this guy and get him off a life sentence. Sorry, spoiler alert but it's worth listening to just to find that out. Slow Burn is a great series. Caliphate has come into question recently with some of the questions around how much they rely on one particular source and how much you can trust him. But it's interesting in terms of storytelling. Serial, obviously. I loved the first series of Serial and some of the previous, sorry, the subsequent series I found sometimes a little bit too much detail and too complex to follow. That's just my personal opinion. Catch and Kill podcast by Ronan Farrow, and of course, The Tip Off, which I would love you all to listen to, and it's available on Acast and iTunes and others. So thank you so much. I appreciate that that was quite a lot of looking at my screen. I'm gonna try and turn screen sharing off now. So, um, how do I do that? Okay. Maybe you can come back to me. So, uh, yes, thank you so much for thank listening. Thank you so much, Maeve. This was a great crash course of, uh, for those interested of starting uh, their own podcast and, of course, telling investigative stories through audio. Um, because we're almost out of time, even though I can keep asking you questions for another hour, um, I just wanted to uh, touch on something. You mentioned that in the US, this is um, a genre that is used by investigative journalists. Uh, for example, uh, you uh, played a clip from The Reveal. They have been doing investigations for quite a while. Um, using audio, of course, we all know about serial. Do, do you think we'll see more uh, investigative uh, podcasts in Europe, Europe as well? Yeah, I really hope so. Um, I think the US is a bit advanced in its model. So I think it's found a way to um, monetize <laughs> podcasts in a way that maybe the European markets need to develop and that can be a huge thing especially with investigations uh, in the dark that example that I, I gave my favorite one you know they all moved to 
think it's Mississippi, uh, and stayed there for a year to report. And that takes a huge amount of funding. Um, and, you know, you need to have somebody to back that and to follow it up. But I think we, I think the US model has shown just how engaging and interesting they can be. Uh, the daily, the New York Times is daily podcast, you know, isn't always investigative journalism, uh, but I think has brought a lot of readers, a lot of subscribers to the New York Times um, and has shown the benefits of, of what doing that, you know, how you can reach new audiences and reach them in different ways. So I'm really hopeful that, that the European model will continue. And please, people do let me know if you, um, if you hear of great European ones, my, my language skills. Uh, aren't too developed but <laughs> if there's any English or Spanish language ones I would love to hear. And what what is um, I don't know one big takeaway you could offer from uh, doing investigative podcasts yourself I mean you mentioned the uh, domestic violence story etc. I think it is um, it's a really beautiful medium to tell intimate stories in a really interesting way. And you can get access that you might not get with a film camera, for example. People tell you things if you have a microphone and they sometimes forget about the microphone or they don't feel as intimidated as if they're on camera. But you can set the scene in a much easier and sometimes more engaging way than you can in a written piece. So I think it's a really nice balance of storytelling but intimacy, but um, kind of ease of access. And um, I guess democratization as well of who gets to tell stories. You know, you don't have to, I did talk about the benefits of having an editor, but you don't have to pitch to an organization to tell it. And that means that we hear stories that old white middle-class male editors might not think are interesting because people just have the means to tell their own stories. And so we hear different voices. Um, and I think that's really positive for investigative journalism. And I think that's actually a pretty good end uh, to, to this session, uh, seeing uh, podcasts as a democratizing platform, uh, which could offer us uh, a diversity of voices. And you mentioned this in your presentation as well, but it's also, it could be an affordable way to, to tell untold stories, basically. And uh, we as journalists increasingly see, uh, see that, uh, you know, those are uh, everywhere, basically. Uh, well, thank you so much, May, for joining us tonight. Um, it was uh, a, a quite useful presentation and I'm sure you've is inspired some people maybe to take on podcasting. Um, thank you for those of you who join us tonight and don't miss out to join us tomorrow. You'll be in good company again. Tomorrow we'll showcase some very interesting podcasts in uh, Central and Eastern Europe. Uh, we'll talk about uh, something that Maeve uh, just touched on and she will be one of the po panelists. We'll talk about the importance of female voices in, in podcasting and hearing uh, this diversity of viewpoints. And we will also learn about the incredible journey of Radio Ambulante. Uh, this is the only uh, Spanish language podcast that's part of the NPR's uh, network and it's being re re broadcasted by them. So uh, yeah, it's going to be an interesting Saturday if you decide to spend it with us. Thank you so much for joining us. Have a good evening. <laughs>